All right. Good morning, Greg. Welcome to True Hope Cast. I hope you're doing well today. How are you? I'm doing well, Simon. Thanks. Good to be here. How are you doing? Wonderful. Yeah, I'm great. Thank you. It's a beautiful sunny day here in British Columbia. Definite transition towards um, the autumn as it's just getting a lot chillier. But I like slippers. I like cozy socks. I like pajamas. So it's my, <laughs> my kind of season. So it's it's all good. Thank you. Nice. Um, just as an introduction, Greg, would you just let, let the audience know who you are and what it is that you do? Sure. Yeah, I help leaders and entrepreneurs address anxiety, depression, chronic pain, often symptomatic of unresolved trauma, really resolving the burnout, emptiness, overwhelm um, of just day-to-day -day life and responsibilities of leadership. How did you get into that? Like, is there a story there? Um, <laughs> there there's, there's many stories there for sure. Um, you know, I developed the healing practices that I now share and teach with my clients and students uh, on my own journey, healing my own anxiety, depression, and chronic pain. Um, I was introduced to energy medicine through a friend at a time when I was living in so much chronic pain that when she offered me a massage, I did not want a massage that was just too painful. Um, and at that time, I'd never heard of energy medicine, but when she offered it as an alternative, um, you know, I had implicit trust in her. So I was very happy to kind of open up to something new. And I realized I found I found something I didn't even know I was looking for. Um, you know, just a lifetime of chronic tension and holding in my body that was just, you know, horrific pain, just started to soften, just started to melt. You know, I found myself being able to catch my breath for the first time ever. Uh, so uh, when I find something that I know I'm onto something, I, I, I jump head in, uh, you know, head first. And so within a year, I was studying energy medicine and Reiki while I was living in Seattle. That led me to a year in India studying mindfulness and somatic-based practices to kind of release stress and tension in the body. Uh, coming back to the States, diving more into the world of yoga and Ayurveda, you know, understanding the subtle energy body. Um, really understanding how then we store trauma in the body. I was introduced to trauma and neuroscience through a friend and a colleague. Um, and so, you know, in the last nine years, that was 25 years ago. And the last nine years have been kind of reverse engineering how I kind of intuitively piece together these practices to heal myself and have been now sharing that with clients and students for the last two decades. That's amazing. Cool. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that. And I often have so many amazing people on the show who have been through their own traumas, have been through through their own pains, pain and anxieties and depressions, and that leads them to this wonderful place of light where they're able to, you know, um, use that experience to help others and support others and educate themselves to, you know, help other people and not have to go through all the, those difficult times. I have so many amazing people on the show that, that have gone that that through that kind of pathway i don't often ask like what why do you think it is that so many amazing um practitioners coaches and um, the healers come from from that place of of self recovery like wh why do you think that leads people there um you know i think two things we often teach what we need to master ourselves so the more i share these practices the more it supports my own growth uh, you know i'm committed to a growth path. And so just continuing to share growth practices with others just continues to support my deepening into practice. But also I kind of reached a point where, you know, my life had transformed so remarkably, um, kind of beyond my belief, actually, that I reached a point where who am I not to share these practices? We live in a world that is feeding off of division and isolation, you know, trauma, I'd say is the largest epidemic we have, you know, globally. And I have really powerful tools and resources to help support and, you know, shift, shift the tide, so to speak on, you know, what I'd say most of humanity is really struggling with. So if my cup is overflowing, who am I not to share that with others? Yeah, I think that's a really beautiful way of looking at it. And what a wonderful way to be able to serve other people and to you know support each other and as you, as you say like break down those divisions of of isolation and trauma and bring people together within within community within community and group settings and you know using tools and practices along the way and i want to ask you about energy medicine because if you if you and i were to sit down and have a cup of coffee 
and talk about energy medicine, I would ha I would have some things to say because I have some experience with it. I kind of know a little bit about how you know, storing energy in let's say a, neg a negative way in the body you know leads to maybe trauma and pain and, and chronic issues along the way but honestly if i sat down with my six best buddies from from england in the pub and had a beer and i brought up energy medicine i don't know what their eyes would do you know they gloss over they would they wouldn't really know what i was talking about so i wonder how do you bring that up to people who don't really have a concept yet of like what what energy medicine means because we have this very conventional idea of what medicine is you know we go to the doctor we have drugs we have surgeries we have all these let's say new protocols when it comes to medicine you know i would consider conventional medicine to really be kind of like old school alternative complementary what we call now to be like the traditional types of medicines that you would go to and energy would be a significant part part of that so how do you bring the that idea of energy medicine and explain it in a way that's not like you know like airy fairy like nonsense hoo ha quackery stuff like i'm interested to know how you do that on a personal level because i need to up my game when it comes to explaining these things in, in a way that you know helps people start to think a little bit differently about like what energy means sure so i look at health as movement and expression i look at disease and illness as stagnation and i look at you know how we are traditionally approaching health in our you know allopathic <clears throat> medical world is treating and managing symptoms and while pain and symptom management is sometimes necessary, it's not actually addressing the stagnation in the body, um, right? And so folks that come to me, they're coming to me because they have an understanding that there is trauma that is underpinning their anxiety and depression and chronic pain. But there's a lot of misinformation out there, right? A lot of people have been led to believe that a chemical imbalance is what's causing anxiety and depression. Research actually hasn't proven that. Um, but if all we do then is take a medication to treat a chemical imbalance, we're really just treating a symptom because the chemical imbalance is symptomatic of something else, right? And we need to actually take a few steps back and understand that trauma and, you know, childhood attachment are really big components, you know, at play beneath chemical imbalance, anxiety, and depression. So we need to not be treating the tip of the iceberg, but the underbelly of the iceberg. How energy medicine does that, you know, I look at the body and the mind as a symphony orchestra. So all of our emotions, all of our cells, all of our tissues, our muscles, our endocrines, our neurotransmitters, our hormones are all part of the symphony orchestra. So when we're experiencing health, all those different parts are in constant communication with one another and we're making sweet music, right? That's when we're in balance. That's when we're experiencing health. Um, when the nervous system gets short circuited because of trauma or stress or environmental or hereditary influences, we start to create a lot of noise. The communication between the different parts of us starts to break down. And the more that communication starts to break down, the more we start to experience our symptoms, illness, and disease. You know, it's also understanding that when trauma gets lodged in the body, you know, and a traumatic experience is too much too soon. It's an overwhelming adverse experience that we don't have the capacity to fully process or metabolize, right? So it gets stored in the body. So that trauma is what's creating the stagnation in our tissues and in our cells. That's creating our chronic inflammation. That's compromising our immune system. That's, you know, creating the brain fog. That's creating the pain because all of a sudden our energy isn't moving. The communication between all these parts is now no longer functioning. So we're no longer functioning as a whole. You know, we start to get fragmented and split. And so we start to lose connection with ourselves. So healing is really restoring our connection with energy medicine, that is, to our innate wisdom. And innate wisdom is a term in chiropractic. You know, our innate wisdom is if we get a paper cut, there's an innate wisdom that sends platelets and proteins and orchestrates all those biochemical transmissions. So energy medicine is just helping to break up the interference patterns that are blocking our connection to our innate wisdom. 
And the more we restore our connection to our innate wisdom, the more our body's natural capacity to heal comes back online. Greg, that was beautiful, buddy. That orchestra image was just fantastic. I think you explained that incredibly well. And yeah, that's just a, it's just a remarkable way that you know, you're able to look at the body from a holistic place. And obviously so much of your own personal experience goes into understanding that now. And then when I think about um, like the dysregulation of let's say energy and how the energy of a thought, the energy of emotions, the, en the energy of like feelings can end up over a long period of time becoming matter and becoming some part, a part within the body that's causing, a, I know, a dis-ease or some, some sort of illness. And that energy transfer kind of has to go somewhere and really getting to the root cause of, of somebody's concern, even like going back to potential like childhood issues or you know, physical traumas that maybe happened 20, 30 years ago that we may not, well, a doctor or yourself as an individual may not connect to, to, to your actual current pain, or your current trauma or something you just can't get through. It's just such a refreshing um, idea that you're able to just like, you know, take a step back and, and recognize all of those things from kind of a holistic standpoint. I'd love it if you could just take a step back for us and just kind of introduce the idea of like where, where we, where we're at now and where, where we've kind of got the idea of like this chemical imbalance and mental health. And then that's, you know, we can, you know, we can deal with the chemical imbalance by, you know, introducing more chemicals or blocking a certain chemical with, you know, pharmaceuticals. Where, where are we with that in regards to like the, the conventional understanding? I know you're in, you're in San Francisco, right? So you're, you know, you're kind of on that West coast area. I like to think that, um, you know, Washington, Oregon, California, even where I am in, in British Columbia, we're a little bit more, there's a lot more forward thinking individuals in regards to that might not just be the only, only way to help somebody deal with like depression or anxiety or, or another, um, psychological condition condition. But can you just for our audience, like introduce the idea again of like chemical imbalance and, and mental health? Yeah, we, you know, a lot of people who are not looking at the bigger picture and understanding that trauma and attachment wounding are big components of, you know, our anxiety and our depression and our chemical imbalance are just treating chemical imbalance as if that is the cause of their pain, right? And Again, I am all for an integrative approach. So I think sometimes pain and symptom management are necessary. That's gonna help some people stay afloat. And I have clients where pain and symptom management using medication is actually helping to create the stability for them to do the deeper levels of healing. But a lot of people are just you know, using drugs to treat a chemical imbalance without actually looking at you know, the underbelly of the iceberg. So that's just going to keep them walking on eggshells, right? It's going to help them maybe manage some baseline of stability, if that, but not actually resolve the deeper wounding that is, you know, really a liability on all aspects of our physical, emotional, and mental health. Um, but I think a lot of that is changing. I think a lot of the stigma around mental health is, you know, there's conversations like this happening where people are more willing to start to look under the hood, right? I think that uh, I don't even like to use the word mental illness because I think that just implies stigma because I think mental sure. illness is actually just trauma and trauma actually just needs loving support and attention to heal, right? So what if anxiety and depression are actually healthy responses to an unhealthy environment? Right. But right now, when we treat the chemical imbalance, it's kind of indicating that something is wrong with the individual. So now let's treat the individual that has this chemical imbalance because something's wrong with them. It's like, no, that chemical imbalance is maybe a, a healthy adaptation to some really troubling things happening in the world. Um, and so I'm more for looking at how do we, yeah, make healing less about, you know, what we might think of as, you know, pathology, like something that's pathological within us, um, right? And what if what is turning the check engine light on, you know, our pain and our symptoms is actually our body's wisdom. And it's our body's wisdom wanting to call to our attention a part of us that needs tender, loving care. 
Um, and that's, that's what healing is. It's helping us develop a, a strong, healthy, robust relationship from ourselves to ourselves, right? It's helping the adult self parent, you know, the wounded earlier version of self that perhaps didn't get the, the care and the input and support it so desperately needed in early development. Um, and so I think this is becoming more normalized. I have um, a psychiatrist who refers patients to me. To his credit, you know, he we shared a patient and all of a sudden he no longer needed to medicate her. Um, and he scratched his head and, you know, a lot of doctors when they're in that position might say, well, it was maybe a misdiagnosis, right? To his credit, he said, what are you doing differently? And she said, well, I'm, I'm working with this guy, Greg. Um, cause he said, yeah, like you don't need the medication that I was once prescribing you. Um, and she agreed because <laughs> she was feeling better. Um, so to his credit, he reached out and said, what are you doing over there? And I kind of explained my methodology and my work. And so now he refers patients with PTSD and complex trauma where he's treating them medically. And again, that may be necessary. That may be helping keep those patients afloat but it's not actually helping them heal the deeper patterns of trauma. And when we heal those deeper patterns of trauma, you know, then oftentimes we can lessen our dependence on, you know, medications, right? And I've helped hundreds of my clients reduce or eliminate their dependence on pain, anxiety, meds, antidepressants. How much of um, an individual's self-actualization of what they're going through and what they need to do um, goes towards their 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 process of healing because I feel like when somebody is so um, let's say narrow not narrow minded it's kind of like a, a negative term but they're so focused on like you know I'm feeling this I'm feeling I'm feeling depressed I'll go to a doctor I listen to what they say I might you know respond to a few questions and then like and I kind of get this like I get something from them I just in my experience. I have so many people that you know, when I, through my nutrition practice, I used to have like always used to get between like 40 and 50 year old men will come and see me about, about their, about their digestive issues and their, and their psychological issues. And they basically been through 15, 20 years of going to the doctor to try and fix, to try and get an answer or get something from them to help them. But it like something switched with these individuals where they're like, okay, this isn't quite working for me. And then they had to really get into the game themselves and really like understand like what's going on for them. And that rather than just like receiving something to take, which isn't really like, you know, self advocating for your own healthcare, I suppose, yeah. really stepping into the game. So you've made a great example of that of like, you know, the, the psychiatrist that, that you're working with who's referring people to you. What's the, what's your experience with those, inter with your, with your clients or patients, whatever you call them, really getting into the game themselves and having that self-actualization and how that assists them to get better. Sure. Yeah. I mean, by the time people choose to work with me, they are willing to roll up their sleeves and do the work. Right. And I get it. I grew up with chronic ear infections and strep throat, and there's nothing more than I wanted to go to the doctor, take a pill and have get better, have someone else fix me. And, you know, in, early childhood with my chronic pain. I wanted to go to a chiropractor and I just wanted the chiropractor to straighten me out. And I didn't want to participate other than just receiving this adjustment to make me feel better. None of that really worked <laughs> for me. Um, and so by the time people come to work with me, they are recognizing that, you know, they're done with quick fixes. They're done with chasing, treating and suppressing symptoms. You know, they are often at the end of their rope because they've tried seemingly everything under the sun and nothing's moving the needle. Um, and I think that's the beauty of, you know, how I've synthesized energy medicine with trauma and neuroscience and somatics and mindfulness to create a really robust, comprehensive set of tools and practices that support healing on all levels, body, mind, and spirit. Right. So yeah, by the time folks come to me and I mean, I have an initial call before, you know, anyone works with me one-on-one -on -one, um, and, you know, they, they've got skin in the game, right? And they are committed to a long-term arc of transformation. There's no silver bullets when it comes to healing trauma, anxiety, or depression. Um, you know, it's a journey. And it is a journey of coming to know ourselves more deeply. And I'm not here to convince anyone of that. You know, years ago, I had a client that said, well, I don't know if I really believe that I, people store emotions in their body. I'm like, okay, 
Well, that's how I work. Um, if that's not, if that doesn't work with you, that's okay. But I'm, I, I'm not here to convince anyone of anything. Um, people can believe what they want. And the wisdom of the work when people are willing to show up is that it helps us dissolve our attachment to fixed beliefs so we can live more according to our own lived experience instead of to a bunch of, you know, set constructs, you know, and that's the, that's the mindfulness work, right? Our, our conscious mind is only the tip of the iceberg, right? And that's what we think we believe, but the imprints of trauma stored in the body are kind of governing the subconscious and unconscious mind, which is what we truly believe for better or for worse, right? And how that's starting to show up in our health. So yeah, folks find me when they're really eager to start to look under the hood and kind of start to get to know themselves at this more intimate level. Do you find that people go through that, that those initial stages um, before they come and see you where they might be experiencing that pain or that trauma for, you know, they could be experiencing that every single day for, for many, many years. Is there any type of pattern there with the type of person that comes to see you, right? Whether that's, you know, age, I suppose, specifically, because, you know, I think about the, I wouldn't have been able to really comprehend or understand, let's say, holistic medicine or functional medicine at the age of 20. I just don't think I would have been able to wrap my mind around that, probably not even at 25 or 28. But when I started to go through, you know, some changes, but on my own and started to get my skin in the game in regards to reversing and changing my own health, then I was literally like, you know, creating new pathways in my brain and understanding more and being open towards that type of change. So are there a lot of people that you see who have, who have, who have gone through really long periods of time of, of distress and they're kind of, and they're just like, finally, like they need an alternative or something, something different from you. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the clients that the psychiatrist I partner with has referred to me had been in traditional talk therapy for 30 years and they were being treated, you know, through psychiatry, um, for depression for decades. Um, they were being treated for migraines through their neurologist for decades and just getting by, you know, if that, um, so yeah, I had another client that was referred to me who was basically bedridden for two years. Uh, they were $100,000 in medical debt. They had seen over 200 doctors, right? And so not to say that um, people need to be struggling to this degree to work with me, but I tend to have a knack for helping address, you know, the many causative factors that are at play. And that may be, you know, beliefs that are stored in tissue, memories that are, you know, impacting hormones, which are then, you know, impacting beliefs, you know. So the client that, you know, came to me and their neurologist was trying to treat their migraines. Well, their neurologist and the medications they were taking from their psychiatrist weren't actually helping them heal early childhood trauma that was stored in their body as a whole lot of fear, repressed anger, and shame. So as we help their body start to metabolize the fear and the anger, the shame, well, not only did the migraines go away, but they started to create different boundaries in their life. They started to develop different types of relationships to get their needs met. They started to actually get in touch with their needs, know what they want and desire. Um, so they're finally living for themselves instead of for everyone else. So it's like how that, how our biology and our physiology start to play out in our behaviors and our beliefs you know all of these pieces are related and we can start again as we reconnect to that innate wisdom and the symphony orchestra starts to come back online we start to just live in the resonance and the truth of who we are and then all the noise just starts to break up it starts to fall away beautiful greg i love it in in your experience with work working with you know this psychiatrist person who you know refers to you and has obviously recognized that um what you're doing works and you know they they want to complement their own practice by you know endorsing you and getting you involved with their patient's care which is phenomenal it's amazing you know i wish that happened more but we, with your experience with that with that you know conventional psychiatry conventional medicine when it comes to mental health do you think there are any particular tw easy not easy but like simple tweaks that could happen within that process that would make you know you more accessible to these individuals and help people you know 
recognize that they've got actually a lot of power within themselves to get themselves on the right path quicker rather than having to go through 30 years of of therapy that doesn't really work for them. Yeah. Well, I think that's just a sign of our times, you know, now that psychiatrist, you know, he won't treat someone for 30 more years before letting them know they have another alternative. So it's just building, you know, a, a, an awareness in our culture. And I think that's happening more and more. You know, Reiki is being taught in oncology centers and hospitals, you know, nationwide, right? There's programs for veterans, you know, where Reiki is, you know, being registered that veterans with insomnia are now falling asleep in this short period of a Reiki session. So there's, there's growing awareness and I think more and more accessibility, especially online, you know, now I can teach my programming online, so it's not location dependent, you know, so that makes it that much more accessible as well. So I think I think we're seeing that happen um, as we speak. Beautiful. I didn't know about the Reiki and oncology in the States. That's really, really cool. I, I, I love that. Just bringing that idea of an alternative practice to, you know, support people through what's already a very, you know, traumatic event but to actually have to deal with the initial trauma as well like it's you know it's, it's compounding so it's just wonderful that people are getting that type of support and education um with your work in regards to you know somatics and mindfulness energy medicine can people reduce or eliminate their you know quite significant dependence on antidepressants anti-anxiety meds sleep meds pain meds etc or is that like a kind of long process to to work off those things I've seen many, many of my clients shift their relationship to their medications. How I work is non-diagnostic and non-prescriptive. So that's, that's a conversation my clients have with their healthcare providers, you know. Um, but as they start to feel better, they start to open up the conversation. And then maybe they run some other lab work. And, you know, so that's, that's something that's between my clients and, yeah, their Western medical doctors. That's nothing I advise them on. But... The function of my work is helping them heal, you know, all these underlying patterns. So if you're starting to address the, the underbelly of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg and symptoms tend to start to melt away. What do you um, it's different for everyone. I mean, and I also have clients who are very happy to stay on their medications, and that is keeping a certain baseline of stability. You know, everyone's lived experience is different. So, you know, the types of resources and tools that we want to lean on or that are necessary for, you know, the support we need is very individualized. What do you think? I mean, this is different for everybody, right? As you say, some people want to come off medication. Some people might want to do that quickly or slowly, or they don't want to do that. You know, it's obviously very individual, but like, what do you think is changing within somebody who, you know, is on, let's just say an anti-anxiety meds and they start working with you and then they start thinking about not wanting to be on it anymore or wanting to reduce it and then bringing that conversation to their to their doctor what do you think is happening within their body do you think it's like you know obviously that they are healing so they are biochemically changing but do you think there's like this dependence on this pharmaceutical to keep somebody balanced like what do you what do you think is happening there like do you think it's more psychological or like physiological Again, if you're healing the underlying causative factors that have been creating illness, and that means the illness is no longer presenting itself. So if the illness is no longer presenting itself, you're less likely to need to depend on a medication to treat you know, a, a, an illness that has been fading away. Um, but energy medicine is really calming the cardiovascular system. You know, it is regulating the nervous system. It's boosting immune function. And I look at those three critical components of energy medicine as, you know, probably the top three indicators of, you know, supporting overall health and wellness. So if, if folks are continually committed to a path of healing where those three pieces are coming online, um, it's going to, do wonders for their ability to navigate kind of the, the ebbs and flows of life challenges and health challenges. Um, and so, yeah, that's someone's depend, someone may be dependent on something because they haven't healed, you know, the underlying factors. So once you heal the underlying factors, that dependence uh, is less likely to be, you know, such a, such a piece to look at. 
totally absolutely um is there a, a particular piece of like advice or education that you introduce to your clients that kind of like opens up most people's eyes to a kind of new way of thinking about something i've got like a little example in regards to my like nutrition practice was trying to explain to people the difference between your like fight or flight sympathetic nervous system and then your parasympathetic nervous system and how even just engaging with breath work for 30 seconds can really start to you know make that shift for someone who's like very high strung very high stressed and always kind of like in that adrenaline phase and how that can start helping the body you know heal itself in like a in like a normal functioning way that that used to really like get people thinking in a very different way about like what's going on for them on a day-to-day basis with their mind and with their, within their body. Is there a particular like topic that, that comes up for you like commonly that, that kind of has that same effect? So, you know, the seven pillars of my system kind of take people on a journey to kind of map where they're at and where they're headed on their healing path. And that gives people the orientation to kind of get their bearings straight. So yeah, nervous system regulation is the first pillar. So understanding the nervous system, um, is a big component, right? It's like a gazelle being chased by a cheetah. You know, the moment the gazelle realizes it's no longer in danger, it does a ritual shaking and it releases that stress response and it instantaneously reorients to the rest and digest state of the parasympathetic nervous system. Excuse me. So helping people understand that healing is helping us learn how to shake off not only day-to-day stress, but the historic residue of stress and trauma that, you know, has been stored in our body and our tissues and our cells, you know, for years and years and years. So not only becoming more skillful at navigating, you know, what's coming at us today, uh, but developing a capacity to flush out the accumulation of everything we've come to bear. Um, So yeah, that's the, that's the first pillar, which is a big piece you know, from there we work into embodiment, right? Because trauma, like the bird that flies into a window and you think it's dead, it drops to the ground. It's just really in shock. It hasn't been able to process and absorb the impact of flying into the window. So it goes into shock. So, you know, the bird eventually starts to twitch and find the wind, it finds the wind beneath its wings and takes off. As humans, we don't do that so well. You know, parts of us will still remain frozen, even though we're still kind of going through the motions of our lives. So how do we thaw out, you know, these different parts of our lived experience that get calcified within us, right? Because when we are living from the neck up, we've really lost our ability to feel ourselves. And that's when we lose access to presence and agency, right? And as we develop our capacity to be present and to feel, that's helping us to then broaden our window of tolerance. We have the capacity to feel the emotional impact of traumatic experience that at one point in life was too much too soon, right? So healing is really slowing down so we can start to metabolize what, um, you know, was often, you know, we were unable to digest previously. So those are the first three pillars um, that really give people kind of a foundation to kind of get started. Very cool. Yeah. I think that that whole, that whole process of, you know, kind of taking things back to fundamentals and helping people start to think about things in different ways and start feeling things in in different ways can really support people and assist people to, to just think about the idea of feeling different and, you know, getting to a place of, you know, more light and healing and less pain. And it's, uh, it's certainly an education, a self-educational piece as well as like actually like getting there and doing the work so i'm just super glad that there are people like you that recognize that and are able to you know transfer that information to people and and go through them on this journey because it's obviously just not always this you know incline of progression into massive healing there's obviously going to be blips along the way that's just like the normal healing process so it's wonderful that you you know you're able to to guide and support people through that journey once they decide they want to be in the game and playing when you're you know you're there supporting them and coaching them through it as like a beginning process where do people you know where would you advise people to like maybe go or reach out to if they really want to begin kind of like true healing for themselves be that from you know pain trauma psychological issues kind of i suppose anything you know just we spoke before we've spoken a few times about you know people who have experience these things for a long, long, long periods of time and 
not quite found their right solution yet or found the right balance yet like what what what's the beginning step for people because it, it can become very overwhelming to have this 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 person that you might not recognize because it is littered with pain it's littered with trauma it's not as recognizable as the individual that that person you know truly wants to be so where would you guide people to as like maybe a first step um you know that's really unique for each individual everyone's breadcrumbs that bring them onto a healing path are pretty individual um you know we can't heal in isolation as mammals we're social creatures we can't live in isolation we can't heal in isolation yet the imprints and the residue of trauma are feeding a, a storyline of alienation and fear um and we sometimes need to honor that too. Someone may not be ready to reach out for support, right? So their breadcrumbs may be just reading some books on healing, right? Reading some books on mindfulness, spending time in nature. How do you develop some resources just to um, fill up your cup, right? Um, but as you start to develop some more awareness and capacity, ultimately reaching out for support, right? Whether that's with a healer, a mentor, a therapist, or a community, right? A, a container where, you know, so much healing, um, I'd say the majority of healing is happening relationally, right? And so how do we find the right support? And it's less about the modality than it is the actual relationship. So finding someone that you can really lean on and develop a trusting relationship with. Um, that's that's where the repair happens. And that's where the, the healing container is kind of the laboratory to um, take risks and be authentic and be witnessed, you know, in your truth. And that that starts to create the foundation for us to start to develop that capacity and, you know, all the other relationships in our life. Yeah, those initial steps of becoming becoming honest, open and vulnerable with with another person and you know really asking for help which is you know such an incredible thing to do and a really smart thing to do when you when you really do need it because we obviously step back into kind of isolation if we're experiencing maybe depression or anxieties or whatever that's usually a very common step for a lot of people but yeah stepping into that open honest vulnerable place really begins to kind of melt away a lot of the personality that we've built up wrapped around this kind of like trauma so i find that to be a very very um highlighted place for a lot of people kind of beginning beginning those journeys those initial steps um you're the founder of prisma right can you tell us a little bit a little, a little bit about that what that is and like and how that works sure yeah and i find you know i developed prisma it's, it's like wow i wish i had prisma 25 years ago sure it would have fast tracked my healing um, and again, healing is nonlinear and it's not overnight uh, and there are bumps on the road and it's a long, windy road. But if I had Prisma 25 years ago, uh, it would have it would have put me it would have fast tracked my healing for sure. So there's a trauma and neuroscience roadmap. I found that I was going through years of therapy and healing, knowing I was on the right track and I was gaining some traction. But I still didn't really know where I was, where I was or where I was headed. Right. I still had no concept of what the nervous system was. So I didn't know how to start to track it and build awareness around it and then start to, you know, work with it. Um, so yeah, the trauma and neuroscience roadmap does that. And it includes the seven prisma pillars, which are the drop pins on that map. So it's the orientation to know where you're at, where you're headed on your healing journey. Uh, within that are all the somatic and mindfulness based practices. Um, and those somatic and mindfulness based practices for my students, I offer, you know, guided practices because um, it's one thing to learn something. It's another thing to embody it. Right. And we can't embody it until we put it to practice, you know, and the mindfulness piece. The mind is a tricky thing to get to know, um, especially when we have trauma on the brain. So the mindfulness is the mind training that's really helping to reorient us from pain to possibility. It's what's helping us dissolve the identification with our wounding. So we can expand our awareness into the presence of who we are. And so as we expand our awareness into the presence of who we are, it puts our pain in perspective. But until we've learned how to strengthen that muscle, um, you know, negativity bias, our brain is just going to continue to latch on to what hurts, what's dangerous, what we perceive as a threat, and then magnify it, right? So 
That's why there's often such a feedback loop around pain, anxiety, and depression, because we feel the pain, then that activates our fear, that kicks up the carousel and a three-ring circus of thoughts and anxiety around the pain, and that can be pretty heavy to bear, and then cue in the depression, right? So the mindfulness and the somatics helps us start to track what we're experiencing in our body, but also create distance between us and what we're tracking. So we're less identified with body sensation and pain. Uh, and we start to develop more of a connection to, you know, this consciousness that gets to witness it all, right? So it's like if our pain, if our body sensations, if our thoughts, if our memories are kind of like weather patterns, you know, we are just noticing them like clouds in the sky. But we're aware that we're not the clouds, right? We're the empty sky. We're, you know, we're beyond the, the weather that comes and goes. So then the last component is the energy medicine piece. So helping students develop an entire uh, self-care healing practice. And again, the energy medicine is what's really helping us heal the imprints of trauma stored in the tissues and the cells. There's just some pain we can't think or talk our way through. And that's where energy medicine is just really profound in Again, shifting the cardiovascular or calming the cardiovascular system, shifting us from fight, flight to rest, digest, you know, clearing out the stagnation and the inflammation that compromises the immune system um, just to get us more in touch with that innate wisdom. Um, so I find all of those aspects pair really well to provide a solid framework to help people, yeah, become their own, you know, best self healer. Very cool. Where can people learn more about Prisma and you and your work? Yeah, gregwhiting.com or prismamethod.com. Beautiful. Well, I'm truly grateful uh, that you are out there supporting and serving people and you've able to come through your own experiences the other side and have created these these programs and these methods and you know, encapsulated even the you know psychiatrists to adopt this work as well so i feel like you're doing such phenomenal things out there and I'm, I'm i'm glad you exist so awesome thank you thanks simon really appreciate your time and our chat beautiful well thanks for coming on for the show greg i will make sure that all, all the in the show notes we've got links to your social media and your website so people can connect with you but uh i really appreciate your time today greg thank you thank you Beautiful. Well, that is it for this episode of True Hope Cast, the official podcast of True Hope Canada. For any information about anything we've spoken about in the show, I'll leave show notes in there so you can get hold of Greg and check out Prisma and the, the amazing um, method and foundations that we've got there. Um, don't f forget to subscribe if you haven't yet. If you're on iTunes, leave us a review. But thanks for listening again, everybody. We'll see you next week.